a banner year for new construction in Thunder Bay. Expected auto insurance cuts may bypass the Northwest. And more criticism of the Syrian government following an attack on UN personnel. Good evening and thanks for joining us. The amount of construction and activity in Thunder Bay this year could be another record breaker. Last year, roughly $215 million worth of construction took place, with the Consolidated Courthouse being the largest project. But a new long-term care facility, hotels and stores could see that record broken by the end of the year. City Council will get a report tonight on the work already underway and what's expected ahead. With more, here's Dennis Ward at City Hall with Mayor Keith Hobbs. Dennis? Thanks here with Mayor Hobbs and Mayor Hobbs a report coming tonight on the, the building activity in 2013 and it's been uh, looking like another banner year for the city. Yeah, that would be three in a row, uh, Dennis. It's uh, really looking good. I think we've issued about 730 to 740 building permits. Uh, so far about 134 million in construction, but the projection is that it's gonna match or uh, uh, exceed last year's uh, building. So it's, it's another good sign that we are growing as a city and we have to keep on going that way. And a, a lot of big projects, a number of hotels, uh, restaurants, grocery stores, all kinds of things. Coming. Yeah, the hotels are really what it is exciting because when you get four major chains coming in, it tells you that something's happening in the city. And uh, we're hearing that everywhere. The mining is big. Uh, now with the two levels of government getting going on the ring of fire, the five northern mayors uh, addressed it at uh, AMO and the uh, government has agreed that we need to step that up and get it going. So. Um, these hotels, they do their homework and they know that Thunder Bay is a place to be. Thanks, Mayor Hobbs. We'll send it back to the studio. Great, thank you. A preliminary hearing began today for a young man charged last year with first-degree murder. 21-year-old Adam Capay arrived at the Ontario Court of Justice on Arthur Street this morning for day one of the hearing. He's charged in connection with the murder of 35-year-old Sherman Quisses during an altercation at the Thunder Bay Correctional Centre in June of last year. Quisses died after a sharp object punctured an artery in his neck. One week has been set aside for the preliminary hearing, which will determine if there's enough evidence for the case to proceed to trial. The Crown is expecting eight or nine witnesses to testify. Capay is being represented by Winnipeg lawyer Ryan Amy. A Thunder Bay man charged in connection with a fatal car pedestrian accident in 2010 remains, remains free on bail, despite having new charges laid against him in London, Ontario earlier this month. 27-year-old Christian Hernandez is awaiting a verdict on charges of impaired driving and failing to remain at the scene of an accident following the death of 45-year-old Richard Carmichael. Carmichael was walking home just before Christmas in 2010 when he was struck by a vehicle and killed. Hernandez has been free on bail since early 2011 and his case went to trial in June. A verdict is expected next month. But while the case was winding through the courts, Hernandez managed to amend the terms of his bail release, allowing him to reside in London. And according to London police, he was charged on August 3rd with assault and breach of his bail conditions. When questioned on the matter, the local Crown Attorney's Office says they immediately sought to have Hernandez return to Thunder Bay to seek having his release revoked. But the Crown says authorities in London refused to act on the request. Hernandez remains free on bail, with his verdict expected September 23rd. Northwestern Ontario drivers may not see the full reduction in car insurance rates that the Ontario government has promised. On Friday, Minister of Finance Charles Souza announced the plan to drop premiums 15% over the next two years. The insurance industry is skeptical of the plan without further cuts to benefits. And the head of the local insurance association is warning that drivers in this region may not see as big of a drop in rates as the rest of the province. Matt Scooby has that story. And we have at this point no idea how they're going to implement or when we're going to see um, any, any reductions. While the Ontario government is planning to roll out its initial drop in car insurance rates early next year, Jeff Jones doesn't know if that'll be the case. And even if they do, the president of the Insurance Brokers Association of Northwestern Ontario believes the cuts will apply more to drivers in southern Ontario. Northwestern Ontario can be one of the lower areas, territories. Uh, in Toronto, you can see 30% higher in premiums. Because of the rates are so high in southern Ontario, uh, they may see a bit more of the decrease than, than the north. 
Jones explains that drivers could see anywhere from a 4 to 20 percent drop in premiums depending on where they are in the province and what companies can offer. And Jones understands that drivers in northwestern Ontario are probably going to be frustrated. I can see as a consumer myself, uh, you know, when the Ontario government's looking at a decrease and, and hearing a number of 15 percent, that yes, you, you know, myself would want to see some of that. We'd like to offer that for our consumers, but it's whether the Ontario government can do it in a responsible fashion. A spokesperson for Minister of Finance, Charles Sousa, says that it's up to the Financial Services Commission of Ontario to make sure that insurers are allocating costs fairly between territories. So in areas where costs go down, savings will go directly to drivers in those areas and other parts of the province won't have to pay for the reduction. Now it's unclear what kind of decreases we could see in the region at this point. And Jones adds that insurance companies don't know how they're going to offer savings without more changes. It's like asking any business to take a 15% decrease in, in their, in their uh, profit. So they have to do it responsibly. And if they can find areas where they can reduce costs, such as the anti-fraud task force, then they can offer that discount to the consumer who deserves it. On top of the task force, SUSA wouldn't rule out a change to the definition for catastrophic impairment in order to cut costs. Insurance companies are expected to start filing new rates in January. Matt Scoopy, TVT News. Protesters descended on Premier Kathleen Wynne's Toronto home yesterday to draw attention to mercury levels on their northwestern Ontario First Nation. Roughly 100 brightly dressed demonstrators turned out, most of whom were carrying musical instruments and playing lively tunes. But Wynne's neighbours were the only ones to hear the demonstrators as the Premier was out of town for the weekend. Water around Grassy Narrows First Nation has been contaminated with mercury since a local paper mill poured an estimated 10 tons of neurotoxins into the system between 1962 and 1970. Wynne has said she would work to address the issue, but the protesters claim no progress has been made. Thunder Bay Rainy River MP John Rafferty is weighing in on the Roll Up the Red Carpet campaign, which aims to abolish the Senate. NDP leader Tom Mulcair is touring the country in hopes of seeing the Senate removed. The campaign was launched today on Parliament Hill before heading to Halifax. He plans to consult Canadians and work with different provinces and territories to see the upper chambers gone. Rafferty says they've been talking about it for a long time and his views are the same as Mulcair's. He says he doesn't know anyone who's happy with the Senate these days. I don't get that excited about a lot of things, but I am excited about, uh, about getting rid of the Senate or the possibility of it. Uh, because, uh, because here you have a, a, a clear-cut case of senators using taxpayers' money to, uh, for travel expenses and per diems and so on to go to fundraisers uh, for the Conservative Party. And, and I, that, I, I think uh, the Canadians should be up in arms about it. The Conservatives are waiting on a response from the Supreme Court of Canada on a variety of questions about reforming the Senate. A boil water advisory remains in effect for the town of Terrace Bay. A thunderstorm early yesterday morning knocked out power to the town's water treatment plant and the backup generators failed to kick in. This forced town officials to issue the advisory and they're still trying to determine why the generators failed and who's responsible. The Ontario Clean Water Agency is the official operator of the water treatment plant. Two water samples were sent to the district health unit today for analysis. An update is expected tomorrow. The second annual Rib Fest is being called another huge success. The smell of home-cooked ribs was wafting over the north side of the city all weekend. The three-day event wrapped up yesterday, and those we spoke with say it was a finger-licking good time. Courtney Rutherford reports. For the second year, the annual Rib Fest was back at the waterfront to tantalize the taste buds of Thunder Bay residents. Four ribber teams from southern Ontario came to compete for the best ribs title, and close to 35,000 people came out to try them. Jack the Ribber took the title for best ribs and best sauce went to Ribs Royale. Waterfront District BIA spokesperson Susan Cooper Rashawn says the turnout this year exceeded their expectations. It seemed to go very well. We're always getting input from people and asking how they felt the event went and asking how we can improve it for next year. So there's going to be changes and, and hopefully growth next year and make it just bigger and better. There wasn't only ribs being sold at the vendors, pulled pork and full roasted chickens were also available. The fires were crackling and the smell of the sauce took over the grounds. Those we spoke with couldn't wait to take advantage of everything Ribfest had to offer. Uh, we just got out here today and we got in line. The lines were pretty long, but it was great. It was worth the wait. We uh, went over here at Fat Albert's uh, Rib Pit 
had a full rack plus some baked beans and some coleslaw. It was great. And now I'm in line at uh, Jack the River. They were the winner here last year, and I hear the ribs are even better, so it's worth the wait. Uh, this is my first time here, and I'll be back next year. Hopefully they got it again, but it's really, really good. The music is good. It's a little warm, but otherwise everything was pretty good. I'm here to enjoy the music, and after I'm going to eat all I can because it's a beautiful day, and I'm happy with with some friends, so okay. My mouth was full, I had ribs, an elephant ear, lemon, and it's a great day, lots of good music. After the thousands of people in attendance got their rib on, the three-day barbecue extravaganza wrapped up. Rashawn expects to see the event back in town for a third time next summer. Courtney Rutherford, TBT News. The Murillo Fairgrounds were also packed yesterday. The 122nd annual Murillo Fair brought together the entire community to enjoy a variety of activities. Now, despite the sweltering hot weather, there was no shortage of things to do. The event included a rodeo, a variety of food vendors, and a walk through the barns. People have been flocking to the fair for generations, and this year was no exception. Organizer Sylvia Goodhart says attendant num numbers were way up, and she attributes the success to some brand new entertainment, along with tractor rides. She adds it's a great opportunity to meet up with friends. Community together and uh, it gives them a chance to come out and, and it's nice to, to visit your neighbor without uh, having to go and have coffee. You just come and your neighbor's next door to you looking at the exhibits or whatever and you can talk to them and compete against them. That's the best thing is competing against your neighbor for your be best vegetables and stuff. Now for those interested, the next fair on the local calendar is the Heimer's Fair. It takes place next Sunday and Monday. Well, it took a few months, but it looks like summer weather has finally arrived in Thunder Bay. With some thermometers hitting the 30 degrees again today, people across the city were looking for ways to beat the summer heat. Tara Allaire reports. Don Alford is visiting the city for eight days and said he couldn't have picked a better week to visit his granddaughter. He says they found a lot of fun ways to stay cool. We go out here in the park. We were here yesterday again because of the hot weather, and it gives them a chance to cool a little bit. And uh, we go to the lakefront, we'll be there, and your ice cream places, you know, we, and, well, we do the movies tomorrow, uh, well, yeah, tomorrow, tomorrow we do the movies, so they're going to need the Smurfs or whatever it is. Yeah, so that's, it's, you can do lots of things in Thunder Bay if you want. Kekabeka Falls, of course, is on the road. And that's always an attraction, a sleeping giant. Travis Varga went to Boulevard Lake with some friends to make the best of the late summer. He hopes a few more weeks of warm weather will let him add some hiking and camping to his list of activities. A couple of our friends, uh, we decided to come on down here to Boulevard, seeing how it's so extremely hot out, and we're going to toss this frisbee, go catch our swim going, you know, try to get a little exhilarated, refreshed, and... Uh, yeah, you know, I'm trying to get a little bit of fun in it too, so that's not too bad. I'm happy it's finally here. It's better than having those cool dark days with rain and all that thunder and that, and I don't know, I'm enjoying it. Over at Prince Arthur's Landing, the splash pad has been packed with families enjoying the sunny weather. Tina and Aiden Mines have been putting their air conditioning to good use, but decided the weather was just too nice to stay indoors this week. It's nice. We've actually got this week off, and usually by the end of the month, it's kind of cool out, and we don't really, can't really do much outside or camping and stuff, but it's kind of nice this year that we finally have our summer and we can enjoy this last week off. Probably we're going to go out to camp and just go swimming and on the boat and stuff and just try and keep cool in the water. And it looks like the warm weather does not plan on going away. Despite a bit of rain and humidity, it should remain above 20 degrees for the rest of the week. In even more good news, officials at Thunder Bay Regional say despite the heat wave, the emergency department has not seen an increase in cases of heat stroke. Tara Allaire, TBT News. Uh, as we turn to weather, to own an ice cream shop, I'd be a rich <laughs> man today. It's another sweltering, above average temperature day, yep. and I guess that's going to continue. And uh, as the saying goes, it's not necessarily the heat, it's the humidity. Wow, very muggy out there. And uh, that's why last night, if you were finding it particularly uncomfortable, Humidex was at 31 at 2 a.m. in the morning. Very, very muggy indeed. And today we topped out with a high of 30, but when you factor in the Humidex, it felt a little closer to 38. So another somewhat uh, uncomfortable day for some of us. But uh, if you enjoy the heat, well, get out there and enjoy it now because it's certainly uh, in droves. Now, the winds kind of rotated around, started out from the southwest, rotated around and have been coming in from the southeast. 
for the last couple of hours, but relatively light, 6 to 14 kilometers per hour. At this time, we've had uh, some clouds just start to roll into Fort Francis, but temperatures are still in the high 20s, so still very warm. In fact, across the board, uh, we're seeing very, very warm temperatures, 30 in Atacokan at this hour, 28 in Uppsala, Sioux Lookout, 29. Uh, Marathon, even with the winds from the southwest, uh, still enjoying 23 Celsius, and Sault Ste. Marie currently at 26. Tonight we're looking at a low of 15, and uh, hopefully the humidex won't be quite as uncomfortable, and that's due uh, partially to the fact that winds will be from the north, relatively light, but at least coming from the north, uh, they'll be a little bit drier and uh, won't make it feel quite so muggy for sleeping. On Tuesday, we have uh, potential for some nice thunderstorm activity uh, during the day, and it's partially due to this heat wave, which is not going away because if we take a look later on in the week, the heat wave continues due to a high pressure center well, well to the southwest. That's pushing a lot of humidity, bumping up against the jet stream, and uh, causing a lot of thunderstorm activity, or at least the potential for. Now, so far, the forecast is actually looking uh, pretty nice for the next few days, but there's going to be always a slight risk of thunderstorm activity just popping up, hitting us hard, and then dissipating. And that uh, could be a pattern that we may see for the next few days. I'll have more details on that later on in the news hour. All right, thanks very much, Fiona. One of the people at the center of the Senate spending scandal has decided to submit his resignation. We'll have details on that story and more as your Monday News Hour continues. In a statement, Harb said he had been thinking about retirement for some time.
Former liberal Senator Mac Harb has submitted his resignation to Governor General David Johnston. Harb, of course, is one of the four senators embroiled in a scandal over their expenses. He threatened to sue over claims he owed taxpayers money for improperly claimed housing expenses, but today he dropped that suit and sent the Senate a big check. Julie Van Dusen reports. Mac Harb was a longtime liberal MP before becoming a senator in 2003. In a statement, Harb said he had been thinking about retirement for some time. These past few months have been extremely difficult for me and my family and caused me to evaluate what more I could contribute in the circumstances. My dispute with the Senate Committee on Internal Economy made working effectively in the Senate unrealistic. The Senate Internal Economy Committee had scrutinized Harb's expenses, which were then referred to an independent audit. Harb claimed living and travel expenses for homes west of Ottawa, but the audit found that his residence was actually in the nation's capital. He was ordered to repay more than $51,000. He did so under protest. He was also advised to pay a further $231,000 in expenses dating back to 2005. For a senator who has 15 years left uh, in his term, to do that is a, is a, a striking uh, thing. Harb forgoes an annual Senate salary of more than $132,000. He had already stepped down from the Liberal caucus. He is also dropping his court case against the Senate. There are four senators under RCMP investigation for faulty expense claims. The others are former Conservatives, Pam Wallen, Mike Duffy, and Patrick Brazo, and they've all kept their jobs as senators. It's time to roll up the red carpet. Earlier today, NDP leader Tom Mulcair called for an end to the Senate. We'll save $100 million a year in the process because each and every senator costs taxpayers about a million dollars a year. Mac Harb says over the years he always followed the rules, and he says at no time was it suggested that his expense claims were invalid. Still today, he gave a check to the Senate of more than $180,000. Money, the Senate says, is a balance of what he owes. Julie Van Dusen, CBC News, Ottawa. A high-risk mission in Syria today as UN inspectors begin looking for evidence of poison gas attacks on civilians near Damascus. Friar Stewart reports. In an amateur video posted online, UN inspectors appear to walk through one of the Damascus suburbs. They're collecting samples and are speaking with people who say they're victims of a chemical strike. We went outside to bring in the ambulances, he says. I started to get dizzy and I couldn't see any more and I wanted to throw up. But even before these inspectors arrived, their convoy came under sniper fire. Each side in the civil war was quick to blame the other. One of the challenges that many people do not understand is that Assad might not might have lost control over his shabiha and over his militias. And those guys uh, might be crazy enough, uh, those guys who use chemical weapons might be crazy enough to try and fire on the UN inspectors. Secretary of State John Kerry issued a scathing statement to the Syrian government, making it clear that the U.S. is convinced that Assad's regime is responsible for using chemical weapons on its own people. Make no mistake, President Obama believes there must be accountability for those who would use the world's most heinous weapons against the world's most vulnerable people. Nothing today is more serious. Countries like Britain, France and Canada are now all part of a discussion about what happens next. Canada believes the only way to halt the bloodshed in Syria is through a political solution. However, we understand that this solution is becoming more and more difficult as the crisis enters a very dangerous new phase. As for the inspectors, they plan to go out again tomorrow, but American officials say they already know what they're going to find. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Washington. A monster wildfire continues to burn out of control near California's famous Yosemite National Park, knocking out some power supplies to San Francisco and making firefighting extremely dangerous. Lindsay Duncombe has the latest. In some places, the only way crews can attack this fire is from the air. The terrain is full of steep cliffs and valleys, and flames are jumping from tree to tree with alarming speed. Real extreme fire behavior. Fuels are really dry out here, 
and, and just trying to get a foothold has is, is been very difficult for us. 20 buildings, including about a dozen homes, have been destroyed. Crews are working to protect 4,500 more, many of them vacation properties. 15 minutes to be out of our house, so we only got our kids, our animals, and a little bit of uh, pictures and, uh, you know, paperwork that we really needed. It's a scary thing, you know, but uh, it's just a waiting game. You can't know what's happening. There's a fire on both sides of the highway, and uh, our house is surrounded by fire. Crews are also working to protect a reservoir, which provides drinking water and hydroelectric power to San Francisco. Two generating stations have been shut down, and the city is buying power from other sources. Firefighters are also trying to keep the fire away from giant sequoia trees in Yosemite National Park. The sequoias are thousands of years old. So far, smoke and flames have not reached the park's most popular campgrounds, and crews are working to keep it that way. Our main objectives right now, structure protection, just making sure that we keep everyone safe and we protect that park at all costs. Already, though, much of the forest has changed dramatically. Once dense brush reduced to ash, the fire has enveloped an area the size of Chicago and continues to grow. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Los Angeles. Police in Toronto are still looking for the person who attacked and mutilated an elderly woman on the weekend. The apparently random attack happened Saturday afternoon in the city's downtown core. Police say a man armed with a knife approached a woman in the elevator and sliced off part of her nose. The suspect was a stranger to the woman and didn't try to rob her. Police say the woman's nose has been reattached and she's out of hospital. Quebec's proposed ban on religious symbols for government employees just got a nod from the opposition, or at least key parts of it did. Catherine Cullen reports. Quebec's premier says her plan will unite Quebecers. It is important to precise what will be the rules for living together on, in Quebec, and I think we will we will uh, not divide the population, but uh, contrary, we will nous unirons la population du Québec. Pauline Marois says there have been disputes over accommodating religious beliefs in the province, so the government will propose new rules. Reports have suggested she'd ban government employees from wearing religious symbols. And now it looks like some version of that plan will pass, thanks to the opposition Coalition Avenir Québec. Calling the issue very delicate, leader Francois Legault says hospital and daycare workers shouldn't be subject to a ban. But... We should exclude religious signs for employees being in authority, like judges, policemen, and teachers. Because we think that teachers, they have in front of them children in a vulnerable position. Still, Legault says he's keen to move on to other issues. We know that this debate will divide uh, Quebec. Benet Brith agrees it's divisive and hopes the PQ changes course. Not only are they going to become the arbiter of what is and what isn't religious, but ultimately they're going to become the decider of what is Quebec culture. He and others have predicted the ban would conflict with Canada's Charter of Rights and Freedoms, setting the stage for a legal battle before the Supreme Court. Though the federal government has been relatively reticent to weigh in. I'm a big believer in freedom, and a big believer in freedom uh, everywhere, uh, but uh, the mandate that I have is, uh, is uh, in foreign affairs. Pauline Marois says before anyone starts talking about conflicts with Canada's charter, they should wait to see the legislation in the coming weeks. Catherine Cullen, CBC News, Montreal. Well, dozens of boats hit the water for a race in central Latvia over the weekend. But if you look closely, these aren't just any normal boats. They're made of milk cartons. Each team got a thousand empty cartons to play with. They crafted their very own fully functioning boat. And some contestants even came out in full carton regalia. The prizes include the most attractive boat and the most innovative. Hmm. Let's take a look at activity <laughs> on the markets now. In Toronto today, the TSX slipped two points to 12,760. Wall Street saw the Dow drop 64 points to 14,946. And the Nasdaq held relatively steady at 36.57. The Canadian dollar dropped two one hundredths to 95.21 cents US. Gold fell almost $3 to $1,393 an ounce. 
Crude oil lost 50 cents to 105.92 a barrel. Of all the sunny hot weather we're having, great tight time to spend a day on the golf course. You're starting on the golf course with tonight's sports report. Yeah, and we have the last local major coming up uh, next weekend. I bet you uh, officials are glad it wasn't this past weekend because <laughs> yeah, that would have been awfully hot. Well, teenage sensation Lydia Ko of Australia repeated as champ at the Canadian Women's Open Golf Tournament in Edmonton. The 16-year-old fired a final round 664 to win it by five shots. And the first of four FedEx Cup events would wrap up Sunday in New Jersey, it's the Barclays. Candace Graham Dallet misses the birdie putt here, but he would finish in a tie for second, finishing with a, a scorching 65, so he ends up at 10 under par. Tiger Woods battled through back spasms on 13. He hit the green on his fourth shot, but he would miss the par putt for his second bogey of the day. He was struggling to even get the ball out of the hole, but he would play on. How about Ozzy Adam Scott for Bird on 14? He would be money to go to 10 under par. Then on 16, Scott drops another birdie putt, ending up with a 66. He had the clubhouse lead at that point at 11 under. Back to Tiger, he faces an uphill putt on 17. That's a birdie, so he trailed Scott by only one. Then on 18, Woods with a chance to tie for the lead, but he will come up short. So Adam Scott from Australia wins the Barclays tournament. Woods and Dillette end up tied for second. Hockey Canada's Olympic orientation camp continued today in Calgary. The 46 players aren't skating because of insurance costs, but they did play some ball hockey on the olympic size rink to get them used to the larger rink that will be used in Sochi, Russia early next year. Peter Armstrong has more on the camp in this report. 
It was the most watched television event in Canadian history. An astounding 26.5 million people in Canada watched the gold medal game in Vancouver. 80% of Canada's population on tenterhooks through overtime until this. Now, with the next Olympics around the corner, 46 of Canada's best players are meeting for an informal information session. There will be no skating, no tryouts, no decision about the final roster. 25 players will go to Sochi. The coaches say maybe 11 of those spots have been secured. Everyone else, even the gold medal winning goalie from 2010, will have to fight for a spot. I think uh, it's not anybody's job to win or lose. I think uh, it's an open competition and whoever plays best deserves to be the starter. Weighing on everyone here is one disturbing stat. It's been 61 years since Canada's men won on international ice. During the 2006 Winter Games, Canada struggled on international rinks and placed a disappointing seventh. Hockey analyst Elliot Friedman says that loss still haunts this team. I think that Steve Eiserman has talked a lot about uh, what he saw about that team that was in Italy and why it failed. He felt they were too slow. At the heart of this is the size of the ice. NHL rinks are smaller, 200 feet long, 85 feet wide. The Olympic rink is significantly wider. Simply put, that extra 15 feet of ice opens things up, making the decisions about who gets to go to the camp all the more difficult. It is a different game. It really becomes a... Uh, uh, a lot more like soccer um, in that you're, you've got to defend more as a team and, and pressure more as a group of five. And so players are working out at summer camps like this. Among them, Pittsburgh Penguin James Neal. He's young, he's fast, he's played well on international ice and knows all about the pressure that will be waiting for this team in Sochi. When you got the, the weight of your country kind of on your back, it, it puts that added pressure and um, you know how much Canada loves hockey and, and wants that gold medal. That said, if they're not here to try out or to skate, what is Team Canada doing here in Calgary? Well, some team building, some strategy, and certainly some PR. But there's no question, the roster of this team is going to be determined by how these guys play when the NHL season starts. And that doesn't happen till October. Peter Armstrong, CBC News, Calgary. Well, a triple header in senior men's baseball yesterday. The Coastal Steel Orioles and Thunder Bay Wolves would split a pair while the first place Daytona Dodgers roughed up the on-deck athletics 15-2. In the majors, the Blue Jays open a three-game series at home uh, with the Yankees tonight. New York leads the season series 12-1. In Houston Sunday, the Jays would snap a one-all tie in the ninth. Ryan Goins with a ground out. It would score Anthony Ghost. Jays snap a seven-game skid. Two to one would be the final. Red Sox and the uh, Dodgers. Sixth inning is 3-1. Boston, Jared Soto-Lamakia connects for the two-run homer. They go on a romp 8-1. to one. They lead Tampa Bay by only one game in the East. And, of course, the little guys. The Little League World Series wrapped up yesterday in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. Japan and a team from California tied at four in the fifth. This double down the line plates a pair. Japan led it 6-4. to four. Let's skip ahead now to the final inning. California has a go-ahead run at the play, but Japan will turn the double play, and just like that, they win the Little League World Series in Pennsylvania. Like Hay University's wrestling squads have recruited a pair from Kingston, Ontario. Chris Waltner joins the men's team. He won a gold medal in his weight class at offices, and Heather Brusso joins the women. She was sixth at Provincials. And soccer fans in Vancouver got to see perhaps the best American soccer player ever as Landon Donovan and his L.A. Galaxy paid a visit over the weekend. And the crowd talking about Beckham. When you think of the L.A. Galaxy, one player always comes to mind, David Beckham. He was the face of the Galaxy franchise for six years. Playing alongside him for those years, mostly in the massive shadow that he casts, homegrown talent Landon Donovan. An inaugural member of the U.S. residency program, Donovan is a world-class talent, yet seldom do you think of them that way. Sound like an overstatement? Well, when they visited the White House following their MLS championship, look whose hand the President of the United States reached for and shook first. I suppose, you know, for me, I don't know that I really fully appreciated how good Landon Donovan was until I was coaching against him. And um, I'm not sure that other people fully appreciate just how good he is, but I think that over the years he's been, you know, the best player in the league probably. I think uh, right now certainly Robbie Keane's up there uh, with him as well. But, you know, Landon Donovan, I think not just the... Um, you know, the, the way that he plays in terms of scoring goals, but he creates goals, he's got great pace, he works extremely hard. And... 
Donovan is the most decorated American soccer player to ever lace up a pair of boots. He has the most caps, is their all-time leading scorer, and widely considered the best footballer ever to come out of the United States. Overseas, he's played for Bayern Munich and Everton, yet when you think of the Galaxy post-Beckham, it's Robbie Keane you now think of, and back to playing second fiddle for Donovan. A lot gets made of it good players and teams but I think when you've got guys on your team who are appreciated within like in-house, I mean we've got a few lads like that on our team that may not get all the headlines but they're, they're definitely appreciated from from I'm sure the coaches and management and definitely from their fellow players and everyone who knows how good a player Landon is and, and, and the things he's done in his career so I'm sure as, as long as he's happy and, and, the, and his teammates are happy with him, I'm sure that's good enough for him. Maybe it's his quiet disposition and wanting to avoid the media spotlight or maybe it's being from a country where soccer's popularity lags behind bowling, tractor poles, and pro rodeo. Whatever the reason is, Donovan doesn't get the credit he so rightfully deserves. If anyone should be Major League Soccer's poster boy, it's Landon Donovan. And the final Grand Slam tournament in tennis is underway. British qualifier Daniel Evans stunned 11 seed Kai Nishikori in straight sets at the U.S. Open in New York. Over on the women's side, top seed Serena Williams, Agneska Radwanska, and Lee Na all advanced. Seven-time NBA All-Star Tracy McGrady is retiring. He spent 16 years in the league and was drafted out of high school by the Toronto Raptors. Will Power won at Sonoma, California for the third time in four years, picking up his first win of the IndyCar season. Canada's James Hinchcliffe was eighth, and Sebastian Vettel moved a step closer to winning his fourth straight Formula One crown winning the Belgian Grand Prix Sunday morning. He has a 46-point lead on Fernando Alonso with eight races remaining. Now, I'm not suggesting people race around in their cars tonight, but if you're looking to get some air, maybe, maybe roll down the windows. Yeah, but <laughs> stay within the speed limit, right? That's true. Okay, right. thanks very much, Randy. All right, for all of the contestants who took part in the new uh, TV show, Get Out Alive with Bear Grylls, if they're asked what they did this summer, well, they'll talk about uh, helicopter rides glaciers, uh, rushing waters, and tonight on the finale, they're going to be talking about rainforests. With more, here's your complete lineup on Teletalk. We're challenging your mind and the elements with your Monday night lineup on Global Thunder Bay. Starting at 8 p.m. on Psych, Lassiter's casino wedding is jeopardized by a local crime boss. Then at 9 in the finale of Get Out Alive with Bear Grylls, the teams face a torrential rainforest. And at 10 on Under the Dome, Julia uncovers the truth about her husband's disappearance. Over on CKPR Thunder Bay tonight, mysteries abound and suspects are everywhere. First at 8 on Murdoch Mysteries, an uncooperative witness impedes William's murder investigation. And at 9, a former hockey player's mental state puts a sting operation in jeopardy on Cracked. Teletalk is brought to you by Points, the traffic ticket specialists.
Well, if you're one of those people who's not as much of a fan of the heat we've been having, it looks like you're not going to get a break at least for the next day or two. Yeah, it's uh, pretty hot in Winnipeg, pretty hot in southern Saskatchewan, uh, and that's where it's all coming from right now, so get used to it. Today we topped out with a high of 30, but if it felt a little bit more uncomfortable than that, that's because the humid X actually hit 38 uh, in the last couple of hours, and that's with winds very light from the southwest and then rotating around from the southeast. We take a look at what's going on to the west. Uh, Vancouver has got clouds at this time at 22, a little cooler as you head into Prince George and uh, Alberta, Edmonton just at 18. Bit of a drop since the same time yesterday. Calgary 25 and fairly dry, so they're not dealing with the humidity and humidex uh, values. Saskatoon looks like they're matching conditions, but actually a little bit more muggy there, so it feels a little closer to 30. Uh, Regina currently at 30 Celsius, and despite some cloud for much of the day, uh, has actually topped out at 36 for the humid X. So very, very muggy as you get into southern portions of Saskatchewan. Winnipeg currently at 32, hot and muggy, and a fair amount of cloud cover today. As we head into southern Ontario, Toronto is currently at 25 and uh, cloudy skies, but they've been having a lot of passing thunderstorms. There's a lot of instability moving through this part of the province up into Ottawa and into the Montreal region. Ottawa actually uh, saw rain that just moved in in the last hour or so, but they've had a few passing showers. 22 in Quebec City, uh, but the Humidex actually makes it feel closer to about 30. They've had quite a bit of cloud and drizzle off and on throughout the day. So we head into the Maritimes. 20 in Fredericton and uh, definitely um, a cooler temperature than yesterday. However, the Humidex is making it feel a little bit warmer than the temperature would uh, suggest. So it hit a high of about 25 yesterday with the Humidex. It feels like 25, so maybe things really haven't changed all that much. More clouds as you head into Charlottetown. They've got thunderstorms moving in tonight. Halifax currently at 17 and some gusty southwest winds. St. John's, though, nice bit of sunshine for most of the day. Now, if we take a look at the systems moving through, uh, today we had some precipitation uh, potential just to the south of us, brought in a few clouds here and there. But for the most part, we had a fair amount of sunshine this afternoon. However, as we head into tonight and tomorrow, you're seeing uh, this precipitation pushing up a little bit more, seeing more clouds overnight tonight. And into tomorrow, there's a lot of instability with all of this humidity and all of that heat pushing up from the south, actually well south, but it's, it's got kind of a domino effect. So uh, tomorrow, going to see a mix, or by, sorry, by Wednesday, a mix of sun and cloud. You might start to feel a little bit uh, surrounded because there's a lot of potential for some electrical activity. Temperature-wise, if it feels hot, this is why. There's a lot of heat moving in. High 20s, low 30s in some areas. Overnight tonight, most of the northwestern Ontario is going to be in the mid to high teens. And then tomorrow you can see that stretch of real heat trying to push its way in. It's like a little fickled finger of fate trying to move in there. Thunder Bay might get out of uh, that extreme zone, but it's still going to be pretty hot and muggy as we head into Wednesday and Thursday. We'll be back to more seasonal values, but don't expect it to stay like that too long. We've got uh, more humidity on the way for the weekend. Tonight, uh, some passing thunderstorms for Fort Francis. Everywhere else looking fairly dry, but you can see those temperatures well above normal. And then tomorrow, again, some passing showers for Sault Ste. Marie and uh, passing thunderstorms possible for Fort Francis, 32, very muggy. This hour we're at 28, feels closer to 36, and that's with a fair amount of cloud cover. Tonight we're going to drop down to a low of 15. First thing in the morning, uh, some cloudy skies, 16 Celsius by noon. Humid X could make it feel like 30, and we're looking at a risk of a thunder shower by 4 o'clock, possibly some more clouds, and 27. So very hot for the next day or so. As we head into Wednesday, mix of sun and cloud 26, 27 on Thursday under a mix of sun and cloud. Then we start to cool off just a touch for Friday at 22, but by Saturday, humid humidity kicks in again, and we're looking at a high of 26 for the first day of your long weekend. Well, odds are you've got a remote control in your hand right now or maybe on a table nearby. But if you ever wondered just how your remote control works, 
Well, we've got answers for you in tonight's edition of Cool Science. Did you use your remote control to turn on your TV tonight? It uses light to signal the TV to turn on, but it's light that you cannot see. Take your remote control and turn it so the end is pointed towards you. On the end, there's a little light bulb. Try pressing a button, any button, and look at the light bulb. Did anything happen? Now look at the end of my remote control. Can you see the light bulb on the end lighting up? The light bulb uses a wavelength of light called infrared. This is a wavelength that our eyes cannot detect, but cameras like video cameras and webcams can pick it up. You can try this at home by pressing a button and pointing at the webcam in your computer. You should be able to see the light. Your TV has a sensor on the front that is triggered to turn on or change a channel when it receives the infrared input from your remote. Consequently, anything that has a remote has a phantom drain. That's where power is constantly being drawn in order to keep the infrared sensor ready and working. So plug your TV into a power bar and turn it off when not in use. This will not only save you money, but it will help to reduce your impact on the environment. Now that's cool science. All right, stay with us. When we return, a trip to the zoo. That's coming up right after these words.
Well, here is your daily dose of adorable. It looks like this little girl has made a new playmate at the zoo. <laughs> Friendship right out of a Disney movie. It's easy to see why this video is becoming a hit. It had more than 200,000 views in under a week, but between the baby gorilla and the toddler, can you tell who's aping whom? It's like they're having so fun, doesn't it? Cute. Yeah. Let's recap our top story of the day. It looks like the amount of construction activity in Thunder Bay is going to surpass totals recorded last year, a year that broke several records for the city. Well, the latest from uh, the Canadian Olympic Orientation Camp going on in Calgary later on. And uh, low 15 tonight, but tomorrow another hot, humid day. You might want to bring an umbrella to work because uh, we could see some electrical activity popping up throughout the afternoon. And that's all the time that we have for tonight. Thanks very much for watching. We'll see you again tomorrow. Thank you.